Hey, this is Joel Duff. Last night I saw a headline about a paper about pterosaurs and I'm like, pterosaurs are really cool. I always want to know something more about pterosaurs. And so I looked up the paper this morning and I've pulled out a couple figures from it. I just want to walk you through this brand new genus that was just named in the research yesterday. Uh, and it had one particular feature which was uh, really astounded me. I didn't realize that it wasn't the only one in the world, but it's certainly the only one I had ever heard of that has this particular characteristic. So stick around with me and I'll tell you about its wild teeth. Um, what you're looking at here is just a picture of some cranial diversity of pterosaurs. I mean, forget the dinosaurs. I mean, yeah, I know there's a lot of variety of dinosaurs, but pterosaurs are where it's at in terms of cool cranial uh, anatomy. What, so there's 75 to maybe 200 different genera that have been named thus far from the fossil record and more being named every day uh, as witnessed yesterday. There is a new genus that was named in the literature, which is the one we're going to take a look at. Um, and just amazing morphological differences uh, like the dinosaurs. Uh, pterosaurs also had a tremendous diversity in terms of overall size. You've probably heard or seen pictures of those ones that were as tall as giraffes, but the majority of them were more like the size of a chicken, kind of like the dinosaurs. A lot of them were fairly small, and we just sort of remember the big ones. And the one I'm going to tell you about today is, again, it's about the size of a chicken, but this is one really cool chicken. So let's just get right to it. So here's the paper. I believe it was just released in the last day or two. A new uh, pterodactyloid pterosaur, meaning it's a pterosaur that's of the pterodactyl type. So you can't, some people call pterosaurs all pterodactyls, but actually there's only a subset of pterosaurs that are pterodactyls. Um, and this is one of them. Uh, and it has a unique filter feeding apparatus, and it's from the late Jurassic, as we're going to see, it's about 150 million years old. Uh, this, is, this paper is written uh, by Martel and uh, colleagues, and it's published in the journal, journal PAL-Z, which is short for a long German name, which I can't pronounce, but it is a journal devoted to paleontology. Um, this is a very large paper, and I'm not going to say that I read every word of it because it has a tremendous amount of anatomic, anatomical detail, and I'm not an anatomist. Um, and so there's 42 pages of descriptions of this particular single fossil of a single individual. Um, but I will pull out what I think is some of the most interesting stuff, and let me just read the first little bit of the abstract. A new long-legged spatula-beaked filter feeding pterodactyl, pterodactyloid pterosaur from the upper Jurassic uh, from a particular limestone in Bavaria, southern Germany. Um, and it's remarkable for its completeness, as we're going to see, it is almost 100% complete in terms of its bones. And what is its most unusual characteristic? It has unusual dentition and it hints at the preservation also of false soft tissues. I'll show you just a little bit of the wing membrane uh, seems to be preserved. Uh, it's fully articulated, meaning every bone is essentially joined or uh, all the different joints are there and you can see how all the bones are attached. Uh, both jaws are present and there are over 100 parallel teeth on each side of each jaw, all right? And so that's over 400 total teeth. Now remember, I mentioned that this animal was only a little bit larger than maybe a common chicken. And yet its beak contains over 480 total teeth. All right, so you know those teeth are going to be small. And we'll, we'll take a look at how those are going to be used. All right, so this is an um, artistic reconstruction of what this new genus and species might have looked like. And the name is the Balanognathus, I don't know how to say it, Missouri. Um, and uh, I, I'm showing this picture because this is what uh, somebody imagines the, the living uh, pterosaur to look like. Uh, and I actually, this is how I came to find out about this particular pterosaur because I follow Meg, Megan Jacobs on uh, Twitter and she is a paleo artist. All right. So somebody who has studied biology, works alongside people who are paleontologists uh, and then draws, uh, you know, produces these kind of pictures for basically marketing uh, reasons. 
Uh, I do want to point out that this image shows what looks to be like sort of like small hairs or, or uh, fibers, I guess you could say, from feathers uh, on its neck. And I do want to point out that there's no evidence from the fossil itself that this particular pterosaur had any form of hairs uh, on it, or, or I should really say uh, pieces of portions of feathers. Um, there is a, quite a raging debate about uh, just whether any of the pterosaurs had maybe some kind of plumage other than uh, skin, reptilian skin. Uh, and I'm not here to get into all that. We're just here to look at uh, the bones of this critter and more particularly the teeth. But you notice here the teeth on this spoonbill <laughs> type, type animal. I mean, it really looks like a, a spoonbill bird, right? Uh, except that it has a bunch of teeth, which birds have beaks that are toothless. Uh, and one thing you need to know about pterosaurs is a many of them have many teeth, uh, sometimes very, very large teeth. Uh, and But there are, I guess there are toothless uh, pterosaurs as well. In other words, there are, there are ones that have beaks uh, more so than uh, tooth teeth. Sorry, stomach on my words there. All right, here it is in all of its glory. And there it is smashed into this uh, limestone plate here. Um, and I know this doesn't look terribly uh, glorious in this way, but uh, unless you've, if you look at the fossils, I think this is really impressive, the, the amount of detail here. Really, every bone of this little pterosaur is preserved for us. But the most notable thing, of course, is these two uh, jaws, upper and lower jaw, and all these little projections on here, which are the, the teeth. All right, so all of these things are little rows and rows and rows of teeth uh, on this. And just to give you an idea, like um, there's, I don't know, there's like 45 to 50 different figures in this particular paper going through every single set of bones. And this is sort of like the, the initial graphic showing like here's all the different portions of a pterosaur, all the different major body parts. Um, uh, highlighted for you there. We're just going to mostly look at the at the skull. Um, oh yeah, and I didn't show it on this one, but you'll see there's this area here. All right, that looks like, uh, and and there's actually in close-ups, which I'm not going to show you. There's actually what look to be little fibers embedded in here, which are thought to be embedded in the actual membrane of the wing, um, adding strength to the wing, and that seems to be preserved. So there is sort of a soft tissue preservation going on here in this particular fossil. All right, so where is this? This is in southern um, southern Germany in a limestone pit. And this is just giving you a, a look at, this is actually from the paper itself. And oh, I wanted to mention too, the paper is a CC by 4.0. And, uh, but I need to say that because I, I need to tell you that um, I'm free to share the information from this paper as long as I tell you who the author is and show you the paper and tell you that CC by 4.0. So this uh, image from the paper shows you uh, one of these limestone pits of which there's many in this particular where this where this particular type of rock meets the surface in Germany and which there's a fair number of areas across Germany where this particular late Jurassic formation is found. Uh, and so you see that they're just they've got these plates that they're basically picking up and using for a variety of purposes. And then as they're you know collecting this stuff, people notice a lot of there's a lot of fossils and very famous fossils from these types of locations. This particular pit um, has a number of different vertebrates. Um, I mean, there's everything from fish to these uh, a number of different pterosaurs to a number of archaeosaurs like like uh, saltwater uh, uh, crocodiles and so forth that are found in here. Um, and there, but this for, particular formation is really famous for. Um, the Archaeopteryx uh, fossils, of which there's multiple ones found in limestone in Germany, but not at this particular location. But it is essentially the same sort of um, geological formation. You can think of this area as, well, what was it in the past? Um, all of the evidence from this rock suggests that this was a, a shallow uh, ocean with, a, with a, a large complex of coral reefs. Um, and these coral reefs were sort of formed like small little islands, little atolls. So you can imagine there's like little areas that are above sea level and maybe there's some plants growing on those. And then there's some 
uh, blue holes in there and then they're sort of cut off areas and so this is a, a warm water um, shallow uh, seabed uh, and so th this limestone is set down because it's it's all this coral that then the coral is breaking apart and then it's being washed down uh, into these lower areas uh, and it's in these sort of basins all right that all this material collects and so in this particular example, the, what they think happened with this particular pterosaur uh, is that uh, the pterosaur uh, died somehow, although there isn't any uh, evidence of scavenging or attack on this particular pterosaur. Uh, it died, but it also appeared to have bloated, so it must have sat on top of the water for a little while. Um, and you might wonder, well, like, how did, didn't it get scavenged? A lot of these areas were probably hypersaline um, places, so it might not have been where it was living, but simply fell into the water at this point into an area where really there isn't a lot of macro organisms that are alive in that particular water bed, water area, um, or that particular basin, closed off basin. And it bloated. And the reason they know it bloated is because the rib cage is basically extended unnaturally. And so after it bloated and then released gases, it then fell to the bottom of this deep basin. Uh, and there it would have been into super saline waters uh, and probably low oxygen uh, concentrations uh, at that point. And then it's just being carbon covered up by carbonate sand uh, over time. So then compacted, of course, and turned into this limestone. All right, so that's that's the nature of the site. So from this particular sample, I'm just this is just you know this is Figure 11. I've, uh, like I said, they go through every single part of this. What this paper is is it's a taxonomic paper that is describing a new genus uh, and a new species, of course, at the same time. And what they need to do is they need to set us they need to show how this particular sample is significantly different from other genera. Right, not just other species, but it has to have enough differences to sort of merit the genus name uh, for this uh, new find. And so they go through and they look at all the different parts of the anatomy, right? They have a section on the foot and the sections on the arms and the sections on the brain, a section or on the skull and the section on the, on the, the beak or the snout, right? Uh, the rib cage, vertebra, all that stuff. And they do all kinds of measurements and they can do these all these measurements because of how uh, exceptionally preserved this is. And so you get, you get figures like this. Here's figure 13, which is showing the ratio. It's a ratio comparison of the length of the humerus, the ulna, and the various phalanges. All right, on the fingers, remember that a pterosaur has uh, a very long, oh yeah, I meant to show you that. Um, here is uh, several fingers right here of a pterosaur. And then these are the long extensions of one of the fingers, right? So one of the finger, finger here is super duper long, <laughs> extended way out. And it's on that that you're going to end up having this uh, uh, membrane that is spanning between that finger back toward uh, the other fingers. Um, and so... Uh, you can do measurements, all these things, and then they compare them to other genera, right, and other species that are also known, and they look at the ratio comparisons of those. Part of this is to show that this is part of the same family. These are all other members of the same family of pterodactyloid. Actually, it's a pterodactyloids are a, an a, a large family and this is like a subfamily and this is inside of a subfamily and they're saying like yeah this is another genus in this particular subfamily of, of pterodactyloids uh, and they're so they're comparing the the ratios of the wing showing that you know they have similar growth forms to other members of this particular family but of course then they also show that hey it's really significantly different in other ways as well so probably related to these other animals, but clearly a different lineage and hence the name of a different genus. So now let's get right to what's the most distinctive thing about this sample. The distinctive thing about the sample are its crazy wild teeth. Um, so they had these very long, thin teeth with these really weird uh, enamel um, sort of hooks at the end of the teeth. Um, and notice the, the scale on here, one millimeter, one millimeter, right? A tenth of a centimeter. So this is, these teeth 
are only a millimeter wide. Remember that whole jaw, and I need to go back because I didn't show you the, the scale on here. Here's the scale right here, 50 millimeters, that's five centimeters. So five centimeters, uh, you know, 10 centimeters, maybe 15 centimeters long altogether, right? So maybe only about this long is the entire uh, jaw, right? Little jaw there. Uh, and yet it has more than 100 teeth lined up on each side of the jaw, all right, next to each other. And so you just divide your 15 centimeters by 100 and something teeth, and you're going to have to have some pretty small teeth. All right, so back to our teeth. Very thin teeth, and we have a really remarkable preservation of the entire side of, of each side of each jaw, the bo bottom jaw and the upper jaw. And so in the paper, they actually, I'm not going to show you all the recreations, but they actually figure out all the different ways in which the jaw would have come together. All right, so by doing all these measurements and looking and, and actually figure out how the jaw would have come together, and they show that the teeth actually would have Inter one, one thing would be like maybe the teeth meet each other, right? But no, they show they actually collapse and go in between each other. Um, and so unknown exactly what this little enamel cap is. I think I called it a denting cap before, enamel cap. Uh, and here they're showing the sort of the, the morphological features of each individual tooth and its preservation. And of course, now part of the coloration here is this is this is replacement of rock, all right, uh, material of these particular teeth. But the teeth must add, they had a variety of different features are replaced in different ways. And so you can see these uh, morphological features in the teeth. All right, so, here, oh yeah, here is a something about the jaw. And remember at the end of the jaw, I didn't point that, but it's like this shovel bill. And so it kind of comes out. And at the end, there's no teeth at the very end. So it has teeth all the way down. Um, the sides. So what's going on there? Um, and this is what surprised me is I didn't, I knew that pterosaurs had teeth and I knew that some were for like, there. we know that there's likely pterosaurs that were like birds today that come and they fly right across the surface of the water and they put their jaw in the water and basically they're scooping up fish. In this case, pterosaurs probably did some species of pterosaurs. Remember there's thousands and they have lots of different ways catching food. Some of them probably did that. And they actually have these teeth, you know, elongated teeth at the ends of their jaws in which they're scooping up teeth. Other ones were fishing basically in the water and probably going like we have, we have birds today that go side to side, you know, pushing their and basically filtering through there and capturing things that way. So what's happening with this particular pterosaur? This particular pterosaur, they suggest, was a, um, a shovel, um, a, well, I got to remember the word for that because uh, I know it has here, a ram filter feeding. Ram filter feeding is uh, what bowhead whales do. And this pterosaur is actually named after bowhead whales um, because of it, the, the likelihood that it is doing the same kind of feeding plus the combination of all these little tiny teeth, which are the, the filter mechanism, right? Uh, they're the strainer. And that's what a bowhead whale has. It has baleen. And baleen is all that stuff hanging down right in its mouth. Uh, thin little, uh, oh yeah, I forget what the, the baleen is made of. Um, uh, basically keratin, I believe. And that is the strainer for plankton. Uh, and so they're likening that to this pterosaur. And the idea is that thrust feeding is you close your, your mouth somewhat and you push your, your mouth through the water, right? your jaw through the water. Uh, and as you push the jaw through the water, they found some evidence based on the structure of the, the jaw that suggests they may have had sort of a, a, a pouch. And that pouch then would balloon out, allowing more and more water to come in. And then after the water comes in, you basically you close the jaw more and you squeeze the pouch up and you push the water out. And they also, they're not showing it here, but um, it could be the, the animal pushes in, collects this water, and then could lean its head up and then basically strain all the water out. Okay, uh, And then you're capturing all the little tiny critters uh, that are in this water, little crustaceans and things are even smaller than that potentially. These are very thin, uh, the, the, the amazing one millimeter <laughs> wide teeth. Uh, incredible. Uh, and so 
and yeah, these other two pictures over here, as in case you don't realize that pterosaurs, uh, now we're quite certain that many pterosaurs walked on their wings, right? Walked on their arms. Um, and so where their knuckles, essentially where their knuckles are, it's just that one, remember one of their fingers is super long and extended. And so they're knuckle walkers. Uh, and this particular one would have walked in the water and based on the size of it and the height of its legs and so forth and what the angle would need to be for it to do this filter feeding, they could kind of figure out like the depth of water that it could handle um, and so forth. So, you know, really remarkable stuff that you can infer just by looking at bones, in this case, the teeth of an organism and infer a particular habitat uh, for that organism uh, in, in past times. And so this is a systematic paper, meaning it's a, it's a taxonomy. It's trying, to, it's trying to place what this thing is related to based on all the other types of organisms we know about. Of course, there's probably other ones we don't know about yet. And so we may find other ones that are more similar to this one in the future, might find other species, so forth. But this seems to be, a to us, an unknown genus at this point. Uh, and they named it um, Balignathus. And that name, and I knew right when I saw it, I thought, oh, I understand why they gave it that name. All right. Balina is the genus name uh, for bowhead whales, right? Like Balina mysticus. Uh, and I personally have done, and my, my one of my PhD students has done research on bowhead whales. I've had bowhead whale material in my freezer just down the hall. And so I'm familiar with, with the with the bowhead whale. And so I was like, instantly when I saw the name, I was like, oh, bowhead whale, why is it bowhead? Oh, well look, it has a filter feeding mechanism. I didn't realize too that they're also thinking about the fact that bowhead whales basically push through the water, right? And then they're taking in large amounts of water and then straining it all out. And that's their proposed mechanism for this particular pterosaur also for feeding. So this ram filter feeding. Uh, and then the second half of the genus name is Nathus, which is just the Latin word for jaw. And so it is a bowhead whale <laughs> combined with uh, this particular jaw uh, structure. Um, and then the specific epithet, I also want to point that out. This, remember, the specific epithet is the second part of the name. All right, so we have this is the official name right here, and this would be the paper that officially names it. And so we have uh, Nova genus, so new genus, and it's also Nova speci speciosa, so this is the new species. And where does the specific name come from? It comes from their co-author. So there's a co-author on this particular paper. Uh, this, this particular fossil was actually found more than 10 years ago, I think. Uh, and so just like a lot of fossils at these locations, they find a lot of stuff and it takes a long time to process this kind of thing. They get it probably getting some student to work on it. It's going to be a couple of years of their, their program and so forth. So these, these things take a long time. Unfortunately, during that time, uh, their colleague died. Uh, and so they're actually honoring him by naming uh, this particular species after him. And that's uh, not an uncommon thing to do uh, in, in the world of taxonomy. All right, so there it is. Awesome new pterosaur. Uh, a filter feeding um, pterosaur. And again, I just, I, I'm just always blown away by the diversity uh, of, of past life, just like I'm blown away by the current diversity of life. And what's really remarkable about uh, pterosaurs is if you, if you start thinking about, say, birds, right? And you think about all the different types of birds and the different mechanisms they have for uh, deriving sustenance, right? For feeding habits, right? So you have... Yeah, you've got seed eaters and you have insect eaters and you have carnivorous birds. Uh, you have birds that uh, snag food straight out of the air. You have ones that can swim under the water to get food. And you have, right, you have all these different strategies. And then you go and you look at the pterosaurs and here you have a couple thousand different pterosaurs that we know about. Surely there's going to be a lot more. Like I said, discovering new ones every day. Here's here's one of the, I don't know if this is, the, I don't even know if this is the newest one of the year. I mean, we're a, almost a month into the year of 2023 and this only just came out. So maybe there's been others. Um, but we're going to find more pterosaurs. Um, but the point is that with even with a couple thousand of known ones, we know of absolutely massive pterosaurs. All right, which 
we're not even sure what they ate, um, but they could have eaten large fish. Um, or even some pterosaurs are thought to have even like small mammals or other small reptiles, all right? So be meat eaters. Uh, some are gulping their food down straight, right? They're just lifting it up and swallowing it down. This is a filter feeder, and this isn't the only filter feeder, but it has a very unusual uh, particular style. Um, other, then there are also pterosaurs that look like they could uh, reach much farther down in the water. There's pterosaurs that look like that they move their heads back and forth to find things. There, look, there are pterosaurs that probe the soil, right, right, the sand, to find critters that are living in there. I mean, what about all your shorebirds, right? They're running around, they're picking out clams and stuff like that out of the sand. And so as you look at the different anatomical structures of pterosaurs, you realize that they kind of have a, there's kind of like a, a matching version of a pterosaur for every basically different type of bird we have present today. And when do the pterosaurs live? I mean, pterosaurs come around in, I think, the late, middle, late Triassic through the Jurassic, the most diversity there in the Jurassic. And then they kind of start tailing off in the Cretaceous. Um, and they're really not doing so hot by the end of the Cretaceous. And then, of course, there's this whole extinction event at the end of the Cretaceous, 65 million years ago. This is 150 million years ago, by the way, for these particular fossils. They're just really interesting from that perspective of sort of the ecology. How did they fit into the environment? How did they survive alongside the dinosaurs? Um, and take advantage of all the different resources that it seems like they could take advantage of a lot more resources than dinosaurs could, uh, which makes them very remarkable. And kind of sad that they're not around with us today because they're just really remarkable organisms. All right, I think I've said that enough times, haven't I? All right, that's it. That was just my little, uh, hey, here's a really cool paper that just came out. New pterosaur, uh, a spoon build filter feeding pterosaur Eh, the size of a, you know, it's like about maybe two, two and a half feet tall. Um, so just a little guy. But you could almost imagine just like little flocks of them running around uh, on the shores um, doing their little filter feeding thing. Um, great. Hey, I'm Joel Duff. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye bye.